so the next point is the projects i really need to know how many people would like to continue on their projects and the earlier you can decide the better it is for you and we can think of i put in about eight projects in here that you guys can think of from and pick up because these are real problems and where you'll be able to actually when you'll provide a solution you'll be able to find other solutions that they exist and then you can compare what kind of functionality you came up with yourself so this is this is why i wanted i want you guys to think of real life problems that you may face 3 months down the road when you look for a position now you may be asked to be on a project where knowledge management solution is being built or an intranet for a company is being designed and that is where when you stand in front of a architect you can talk to them intelligently because you have thought about that problem before so this is something that you might want to keep in mind especially here it is not to give a web enabled solution for this project that is not is the idea the idea is to actually think about the problem more before you give a solution so do you want us to code these projects uh at one stage yes but that will be in the third week if you if you look at in the week 2 and 3 that is when you will be actually writing the queries because you want to do the performance tuning you want to have the confidence that if somebody gives you that okay this application is running slow you should know where to actually start from that is very very important rather than at that time start looking into bugs and so that is that is what will actually converge at because i think if we can get that kind of confidence out of this class where you can improve an existing application or suggest an intelligent solution that's more than enough that's really enormous addition you can do and in terms of using database it's your choice you can use whatever database you want and uh, oracle would be useful in the sense because explain plan commands and the commands with which you can actually do the performance enhancement and measurement are very well documented so i don't know if somebody if if you try to use some other database it is fine to explore but make that decision after you find out that yes there are these utilities there that those interfaces are available with that database to actually do it so just just a heads up before you start working on queries think what platform you want to use okay and if you guys uh, rusty had told me that uh, some people don't have oracle on their machines are there some people who because the brios were taken away and people don't want to install oracle on their black boxes so are there any okay so we rusty suggested we actually have one or two computers that we can make servers install server on it so you can log in because all you'll be doing is is very simple sql query writing and actually doing the, the machine in this room is, was already set up as a as a server that has oracle on it for the april month is that did anybody that, use that machine mm-hmm. yeah okay well people did so that okay that's, that's fine that's did. that's enough then okay we can put some more ram on it if needed okay any other questions about about the course structure and about one oh sorry um, if if we're not if we don't want to do our project from two months ago mm-hmm. whenever it was um is there do you want to are you going to provide us with suggestions or your these are these are the suggestions that i could come up oh, with oh i see in the middle there yes. sorry mm-hmm. i should have highlighted it so these are just just these are the things that while working at ed over year and a half uh time frame these are the things that i have in I have seen people trying to look for intelligent solutions for and these are these are real problems that exist so just suggestion I and mean, if you can come up with a better one that's absolutely fine okay regarding recitations uh this course is a very subjective course and so there is a lot to learn from it but a lot of um a lot of information is actually something that you actually want to remember the jargon it's it's like learning physics starting to learn physics you have to understand what term velocity means before you go to the formula for velocity 
Okay, so what we are going to do in this course is actually understand why do we need relational calculus. Then go and use it, but then come back to SQL. Okay, so a lot of things that you will see are you just want to understand and remember terminology so you can appropriately explain a problem to a database guy two months down the road. Second is in recitations, that's when I decided that we should actually include discussions about problems where database managers are becoming very, very important part like uh, this human genome project. If you cannot write intelligent queries, all this data is useless. Human genome project, where any any project where you have a lot of information, that is where an intelligent database programmer can make a difference. So we'll I'll try to see if we can pick up some such good problems and pick up some reference material for discussion. We'll come to the recitation beforehand. We'll give you these articles, research articles, and discuss the problem that they are solving. Why is it such a complicated problem, and what kind of solutions people are proposing? Another very big problem is pattern matching, where you have a huge database, and then you have to do pattern matching and coming up with, with a reasonable solution. So these things where database is a part of the problem, but then over the years, because those problems became very well defined, now database part is becoming more important as we collected data into that. Thing. So we'll we'll try to come up with some some problems that people are trying to solve. Okay, so let's go on to why do you need a database? What is a database, and what is a database management system? So what you think of a database management system is that you have a database. And then it has to actually provide the solution to talk to this database. OK, this becomes then DBMS. OK, so this, this is what was come up with when the problem started happening with uh, file management system, regular having files instead of databases. You can think of file storage in a way uh, when you go to a grocery store. Okay, in a grocery store, either you can have an aisle for every recipe, or you can have food items classified according to some common attribute. So file system is where you add a new recipe and you have another aisle. Okay, what problem occurs is that the same spice is being used here. Okay, so extreme redundancy. So to avoid this thing is is what the relational databases came into play with. Okay, what you want to have is you want to have at least a defined relationship between the attributes of each each object that you are relating them. Okay, so if we if we look at the file structure. Let us try to compare them more critically because interesting. Both sides. Okay. Okay, when you have a file structure, how do you actually control access? Okay, all you can say is okay, I won't give permission for this person to see this thing. Okay, there's no granularity in the access control. You cannot say that, okay, user A can see this part of this file, and user B can see this part of the file. Okay, this became a second problem. Okay, because you want to, so again, what you will end up doing is, okay, let me make another file that user A can see, let me make another file that user B can see. So where do you stop? That is where the the crux was. Okay, you'll keep on having redundant data. Okay, same thing started having if you think of concurrency. If the two users access the same file at the same time, how do you control who does the transaction? 
or when the tra transaction occurs. So all these problems were were coming, but because the management or I should say the the amount of data that was being handled was small enough that you could still think of it like this. This was earlier years. But now everything moved into to provide the solutions for granularity. This is one very big aspect that you'll, I mean, you have already realized when you can actually make views. I'll come to it in detail. Because this is what gives you suddenly that you can create in a database, you can create user-based views of the same data. And that is where you start classifying without any redundancy who will see what and how it is going to be presented. Okay. So now let's, let's think of data abstraction. One thing you should realize, that's what I was talking to Rusty yesterday, is that SQL has evolved after programming languages. And so as anything evolves from a matured platform, it is always evolving towards becoming intuitive. Okay, that is where the strength of any environment comes. It's like these visual basics started becoming a totally a drag and drop because it evolved over years. So that is what you'll realize with SQL is it's really intuitive and that is why all the the things that are done with database are also quite intuitive. So if I mean if somebody points out these things, they they seem very intuitive at this stage, but not at the stage when they were being defined and the problems were being encountered. So let's think of the abstraction layers. So this is our database, okay? There's another layer where you have physical and then you have logical. And views. Okay, so now what you are seeing is that this database sits and it has a physical abstraction layer where all the implementation goes on. Okay? Now there is a logical abstraction layer on top of this where you define the relationships. Okay. If you change this, so the, the two important things that you want to achieve from a DBMS is if you can make these two independent, that if you change the logical model and you don't have to change this, that is great. If you change this and you don't have to change this, that is also a huge improvement. So as long as you can give this kind of independence between logical and, and this one will always be independent, right? Because these are some things that people is just, people are just accessing them. So they don't even have to know how things are implemented underneath. Okay, so what you are doing is you are making selected data available to these people to view. Can you give an example of things at those different levels? That okay, on? okay. So now if you, I had actually put it in the image. I'll, I'll put it for everybody. Okay, so what we'll do is let us think of this logical as where you put define all the objects, their relationships, okay, how they are related to each other. Here what you define is how are the indexes built. Indexes and uh, what, what else will go in here? Because conceptual will take their, here the properties will also go in here whatever the properties of the objects are here. And uh, file structure will go here. So what you're seeing is that the objects and relationships go here and how actually data is being implemented goes in here. So this is the physical implementation and this is logical relationship building. 
So this layer does not have to know how these files are structured. Okay, because all you are going to do is you are going to use these relationships to actually build the next layer. <coughs> Make sense? Is that okay? Okay. So you can think of all the all the constraints are going to lie here. Okay, all the relationships that are between the objects and their their properties are going to lie in this layer. Okay. So now let's look at So another thing is going to be how actually you can um, database access path is going to be defined here. So this is all the physical implementation to enable this. Okay? If I don't get any question, does that mean yes? yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where, where's the, the data types? So something is a bar chart 20 or the, the data base only understands. Okay, so now that is, yeah, so those are now the structures, okay. right? So they, those are actually telling you how these, these variables are being implemented, mm -hmm. right? So they'll go into the physical layer. But if you define an object and its attributes, they'll go in the logical layer, right? Yes. Okay. So now let's think of how actually, this is such a nice picture I made. <laughs> now I, you'll have to see the bad to my hands. Okay. So now let's see, we have I'm going to break the database into two parts because here is our metadata information and here is our DB, okay? And now here we throw in the queries. Okay, DBMS comes here. Yeah, so metadata is information about the data. So like the table structures. Yeah, basically, yeah, so that is what actually defines what actually is being stored here. Okay, so now, now what we have is, so these programmers write queries, queries come in here, and then there is a metadata there. So let me just expand this thing up what actually happens. So now what is going to happen is when the query comes in, I'll make these, these available again for everybody and we can discuss these more. Then what it does is it goes to relational operators. Once it goes to relational operators, that it will go and define what are the access and then you have the buffer managers here. We'll go into detail about these things during the course of lecture today. But this is what is really happening when you throw in a query. Okay, there are, I'll actually go even more in detail about what actually goes on when it hits the database also. Okay, when a query eventually hits the database, what kind of query plans are decided, what decides what execution plan should be used, and all those things. But this is really what is going on when you think of, so actually, if we think, if I'm writing this as DBMS, this is actually a part of DBMS. Okay, this is where the query processing is going on. Okay, so now let's see. So 
so these are all outside the data? No, no, no. I just expanded this. Oh, okay. I, expand. I thought you oh. the queries into it. Oh, no. So basically, all this is what is happening during the query processing. I should actually encapsulate this thing. Okay. And we have the metadata and the database kind of unconnected to anything. Else. Yeah, so what, what is happening is, so you have, so the DBMS software, this, this, the software part of this thing, is what is going to interact here. Because that is, if you think of, okay, what is DBMS? DBMS is, is providing you with the engine so you can interact with the database. Okay, so it actually includes software along with the database. Is that better? You'll like the diagram when you see it later. <laughs> I might have confused you a little bit. DBMS is the software plus the database. Exactly. Structure and file system. Yeah, so that is where you are storing everything in. So if you say, when you say you create a database, right? So you are creating the appropriate tables for it, you are creating, so that is actually your database. Okay. Right? Instead of thinking of it as file structure, try to think of structure of all these objects that you will define that will make your database. Okay? okay? You guys have used the co concurrency control and all that in all your uh, solutions that you developed in Philips course. Did you handle concurrent users? How would you actually, if one person is trying to access or change the information, would you lock it? Will you lock the object? So if you have implemented it, it's good. Otherwise, these are the concurrent transactions and isolation of concurrent users from doing uh, or corrupting the data is another very powerful feature that was that is integral to uh, an asset database okay so in concurrent user basically if because i'm why am i stopping is i'm not sure if i should actually go into detail with this or not because i feel a lot of heads nodding that yes they understand it okay i'll say okay. it i'll One say reason it. i was confused about what you just said is what we certainly used a database which did that. We didn't implement anything like that ourselves. Right. So no. What when you, okay. When so there are two parts to it. Once you are doing a transaction, okay, you want to, you want to lock that object, I should say. That is the appropriate term. So if you are... Right, which Oracle took care of. Did it do it no. No, it is, you have to actually, that is where the transaction comes, right? When you say something like DB transaction or when you encapsulate, that is where you begin the transaction, right? So what is doing, what you are doing is, uh, let me just give an example of a shopping cart. Okay, you go to a website, right? And you say, okay, I want to buy this, you put it in your shopping cart. And then you don't buy it. What should it have done in the back? It should, even if there were two things, two items left, it has to actually reserve one item for you, although you haven't bought it. Because at the time you put it in, it has to check the availability at that time. Now next two users, so now there is only one left in its inventory, and two more users come in. So this user gets this one. This is going to see zero till you actually kill your session. Okay, so that is what is happening at the transaction level. So it... You can think of it as holding back, putting something on reserve. Okay, and these two are of two, two levels. Sometimes you will see, like you click on something and then it, that wheel keeps on rotating or hourglass keeps on showing you something. Is because, suppose this is the table, right? This is buying a car and this is buying a house. Okay, this is, this is where I mean, if you can buy online, so that would be the, the big, we are already here, next would be buying a house on, online. But if you think of this, you're buying a car, either I can lock this whole table, till you abort or commit the transaction, or I can lock this row. So 
I think it was SQL 6.5, if I'm not mistaken. Don't hold me back on it. But one of these SQL editions actually had table-level locking. So somebody could say, okay, let me buy this lipstick and just not go go do something else and lock the whole thing. And somebody else could be just waiting. Rather than doing a row-level locking, still it is bad because it has to lock the row. But at least rest of it is accessible to other people. Okay, so Oracle implements row-level locking. So these these are like subtle details that I think the SQL Server 7 already implements row-level locking. This is one of the earlier editions that. So that like in these DB calls, when it was creating a handle, we were kind of told that that you know, like for an intensive thing, we had to release it, otherwise it would be locked. Okay, so there are so handle management is a different issue. Let me I'll I'll explain that to you right now. So what what he's saying is so there is a pool. Okay, there is actually a pool of handles that if you guys remember the any file that you then specify how many handles and open cursors can be on the database that you open a connection. So you can keep on taking handles from that pool. But if you don't release them explicitly, there are two ways. One is I think with time, they if you don't use them, they'll be made available. But you can do an explicit release because you should always do that and do an explicit release as a habit if you do uh, if you grab a handle so that is where that, that thing comes okay okay so now let us think of what overhead comes when you think of this transaction so this is the database in state A. And you try to do a transaction. And when you do a transaction, you want it to go up to state B. And transaction aborts. You need to recover this whole state back. Otherwise, you have a corrupted database. So what you have to do end up uh, in, in uh, databases, that means you have to log this state so you can recover it back. Otherwise, you'll never, that is what, if you remember, the rollback statement that you have. Okay, so this is now, that means these log files become much more important when you think of doing <laughs> transactions, all or nothing transactions. Okay, so this is another part of then of the database that that has come in. Okay, so now, oh, I thought there was a question. Okay. So let us look at. So this is this is basically an overview, and I'll in the end again I'll. I'll take you through how actually DML compilation takes place, what are the components that actually make things happen inside the database also. But this is like the overview of why databases were designed and the different parts of a database. So now let's look at how SQL got in. And that was, I don't know, I was surfing the website of the author of this book, uh, Ramakrishnan or something. And there, uh, their department said that E.F. Cord, the guy who actually defined SQL in 70s, was in their department sometime. So that was like the, the top guy written that our alumni, he got, he got equivalent of Nobel Prize for uh, this, I think it is called ACM some award for. Yes. No. Yes. So he was caught. I think he got it in '83. He he started off in '70, but he got the award in '83 or something like that. This intelligent guy. So let's think of SQL. Okay. So the structured query language came in, and in essence, what it has is you have DDL. DML, 
and then you'll have DCL, data control language, and very self-explanatory terms. So here, all the co commands that will be used to define, like create. So, what are those uh, data definition language, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. What I'll do is now, I mean, uh, I actually took, I think, quite a bit of SQL for granted because we are, now I'm realizing in our discussions. What I'll do is I'll try to point you guys to a tutorial also. I think there are some really good tutorials available on the web. Just, just to be familiar with the jargon even. You know, what kind of terms are being used if anybody wants to go through it or something. I'll, I'll look for it tonight and I'll spam you guys. So now in manipulation, what you will have is all the, like, update. So I tried to actually collect all the different types of statements in the, in the handout that you have. And update, insert, because what you're doing is you're actually manipulating the data here. So here you are doing the definition in creating and uh, of the objects. Okay. Okay, so now the SQL actually implements set theory fundamentals. All the returns are in terms of sets. Okay, it will be a selection of set of some type or, I mean, or... Uh, update of a set of values, okay? So that is when, once you actually do a selection or any, any, I should say, manipulation or definition, not even definition, but manipulation of any object or its attributes is when you start using the set theory fundamentals. And that is why when we go to the next chapter where we'll define the ERDs and relational calculus, and that is where this relational calculus will actually come into, and it is a prelude to actually having an SQL. SQL actually builds on top of relational calculus. So when you say a join, that is actually the join that we use in set theory of tables when you do that. Okay, I'll, I'll go into detail when we come to that. I don't want to get distracted right now. So now, if we, another important aspect is for the rollback, is that you can have a save point. So a save point is that you can actually define till what time it will roll back. So you can have a transaction going on, and you can define a save point A here and a save point B here. Okay, if you did not define, and here it went, it aborted. Suppose here it aborted the transaction. It is going to kill the whole thing. It will not roll back to the to the point where actually this was successful. So you can actually here, a combination of rollback to the save point, you can actually define and say, okay, if I don't complete this, roll back only till this point. Is that the same functionally as nesting transactions? Or is no, no, no. No, it is because you are just, you're doing only one transaction, right? This is a part of the same transaction, but you are telling it. So if you, if you think of this is you are actually creating like steps in this whole transaction. So you can tell it that at certain times there may be a lot of overhead just doing 10 different transactions, right? So what you could do is that, okay, if if out of these 10, at after every, every uh, I should say, event, I could actually define that as a save point. If I kill here, I want only to go up till here, okay? This is in the case when you have a lot of events in the same transaction. So you mean it might have been successful in building up the shopping cart? 
Mm-hmm. Your board, so you want to go before they even start everything. Yeah, something like that. Or you might... Or you could... I'm just trying to think a good example for it. Let me think. Uh, or something like if you added... Uh, in your bank account, you added your salary check. And then you decided, I want to actually do... Uh, to take out money for mortgage. But maybe that month you didn't want to pay mortgage. Or something. I, all I'm saying is if in one transaction, just think of it, it is useful only when you have events in the same transaction. Because what you are trying to tell it, when you adopt, uh, abort, go back to a certain point. Don't leave, if you actually did 10 transa- or 9 transactions successfully, and the 10th one aborted, you would end up redoing this whole thing and a lot of overhead in terms of resources because then you will come back and do it all nine again. It is better. Exactly. So when, but when you write specific stuff, it's Oracle. That's what... Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm picking up Oracle as an example because Rusty told me everybody had Oracle on their machines before and we all got Oracle's personal edition also on, along with the book. So, is that okay? Because I, I thought the whole idea here is that... It doesn't, just, it doesn't matter. It just let okay. me know, like, okay. you know, what it is. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. So now let us think of what happens to the query when it hits a database or when you actually issue a query. Let's think of that. So in the DBMS, when it comes, say a SQL query comes here. So first is it has to be parsed and validated. Right? This this part actually goes into compilers and all that, but that is the first step it has to do. Okay? Then it has to do is so what it'll do is that okay, it'll parse it, validate it, and it'll give you some kind of intermediate form. That then is interpretable by the optimizer okay so this optimizer has the task of defining so the same query could be executed in multiple ways the steps i should say in, internally it could be implemented because you could go to one table first the other one again or you could do in any any sequence so this has to decide what will be the plan Okay, this is an important thing that you will be using for a few days when you'll do your query, query optimization. Okay, you'll actually invoke an explain plan feature, which will let you see when it hit the database, how much time it took, everything. That is where we'll, we'll get into the real performance tuning. Okay, because right now when you are issuing your queries, you're letting Oracle do whatever you want or your DBMS do what, whatever way they want to do it. But later on in the course, we'll actually go and start fine-tuning our queries by, it'll tell you how many times it hit the disk. Okay, you'll, you'll actually do a lot of performance. You'll understand internals. I don't know how big a database can we have to actually see the differences in performance. But you'll actually understand what actually is happening. Okay? So that is, that is what happens. So now, once this execution plan... Execution plan is is decided. Then you have to generate the code. Okay, to actually implement this execution plan. Okay, when the code generator comes out and it passes its handle off to a runtime environment. 
of the database. Am I obstructing your view? I'm afraid. Is it, is it okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, so this, this knows how to talk to the database. Okay, so these are the things that go on when actually you, so we will try to see how much we can control to actually, or even go deeper into this process during the course of this course in the next three weeks. Okay? Does the optimizer get any feedback from what the actual performance was? So the connect time optimizes it can that is an interesting. I I don't think it does, but I I could be wrong, so I wouldn't say that. Because I, if that was the case, that would be oh, that is then self-tuning database. Okay, so Oracle 9i, okay. Oracle 9i, okay. Oracle 9i is uh, just two weeks ago. Actually, you should see, we we got Oracle 9i for Solaris, and. Uh, AD is now the preferred partner for, or not, I shouldn't say preferred partner. It is all being recorded. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, we are actually, we got and we are the partners for evaluating Oracle 9i. And I actually had the, the luck to do it and installed um, with our sysadmins on a uh, Solaris system. And this is where they are actually introducing the self-tuning database <laughs> concept. Okay, they're doing a lot more features in 9i, a lot more features. But uh, they are actually taking care of, right now what you have to do is, if you are a DBA, you have to manage the disk quota and all these things as your database grows. It is a lot more things are being done internally now in 9i. So they are probably, again, adding another layer of abstraction on top of it and start becoming a black box. You think it also might be self-tuning if it seems like it's having to recompile a certain query a lot of times it would say, oh, I No. This. How would it actually know when to recompile? Just by observation. I mean, by if it sees, if it somehow <coughs> keeps track of everything that's been going on, it just would notice a Could be. regularity. Could be. I'll, I'll dig more into it yeah. uh, when we come to this, this subject. But that is what 9i is now coming to. In terms of, they must have, I mean, this is a very, very difficult part. You know, if you can have a self-tuning database, you have a huge leverage. I mean, just understanding or just imagine how much it adds to scalability. I mean, the query that was written uh, 10 years ago was probably good when 10,000 tables or 10,000 objects were there. If it is a self-tuning database, you go to a million rows and it may change the execution plan. So. Scalability becomes enormous if this is implemented correctly. I mean, if not, it will be Oracle too. <laughs> <laughs> you had a question? It was probably answered. Okay. <laughs> I guess you can compile these queries and then set the source. Why would you want to do that? So, there, uh, what you're doing is you're talking about stored procedures type of thing. Is that what you're doing? Well, already processed queries. I mean, that's just what <coughs> databases do. Let me you think. Just draw customer records all the time. It's just the same query all the time. The you could. You're talking. Is it caching or is it? So that is the question. Because it has to. It doesn't know till it hits here. It doesn't know what it is going to do. Right. All, when it is hitting a query, is all it is doing, it is not thinking here. So you need to put in I would, I would think so. Yeah. I would think is, so. Is, is the, it's not really the code generation that's taking the majority of the system resources. Is it, it's the actual database lookup once you've generated the database. The query. plan, yeah. Basically, once you have, I don't think this is a big so that headache. That part you could cache, realistically, couldn't you? I mean, because the, the query. If you know that you're going to use it, probably it could, yeah. But, it, it, but that's not really going to save us that much because we're still going to have to do the database lookup. Yeah, you have to, what you have to think is that the biggest, biggest bottleneck is going to be a bad execution plan. 
because that is where you if you don't have a good execution plan you don't have i mean this is not eating up your time okay this is a translator you know it doesn't do anything intelligent because whatever execution you plan have is what is going to kill this how many times do you have to hit the database okay okay so let's see another very interesting thing that is there is is embedded sql so generic generic sql gives you a lot of power i mean it is there but a lot of power comes in if you can embed sql so you have a c code going on here c program and here if you can add sql query and then you can finish your c code because here this part could actually provide a lot of gui interface and then you are able to do your sql also through it this actually adds a huge extensibility to usage of sql but the biggest problem occurs you define variables here how does sql interpret them these are different variables different data types if there is an error in sql how do you actually communicate back to c program error codes okay why did it this sql not work so a lot of so but a lot of work has gone into and now uh, so a language in which we can use an embedded sql is called a host language so like odbc the c microsoft's odbc uh open database connectivity this is all written in c c++ okay but it lets you talk to databases okay same thing is with jdbc right embedded in java so java database connectivity all these these are very powerful extensions of using sql inside uh, a host language so what do you call like an aol server with those tickle libraries that have those db calls is that no so that is a little different what does then tickle need tickle need it is not compiled it needs an interpreter only right. right so aol server has a tickle interpreter when it hits that tickle code it invokes the the that is why you have to actually do something like this right because it knows that okay i got the square bracket if i get something i have not forgotten tickle i can't believe it okay uh say okay set ah great <laughs> so it is going to the moment it hits the square bracket it is going to invoke a tickle interpreter and expect a command that tickle knows that is a little different because here if you think i'll just step ahead because he pointed it out but i'll what you have to think is that when something like this is here you need to break this apart before you compile because the host compiler can only do this part right but the dml compiler can do this part so whenever we have a application that is written in a host language that means this has to go through a pre compiler that will break these two okay it will break this should be served to host compiler this will be to dml compiler now this object code is generated for this it has to be recombined here again link it and then send it back to our runtime environment 
that runtime environment, it will talk to the database. So this is what it has to do to do this. So the, the embedded concept doesn't really survive when you have an interpreter, but there still has to be that linkage somehow that's mediated, right? I missed your point. Can you say it again? Well, somehow, I don't know whether it was with AOL server. I guess it was because we weren't using mm -hmm. ACS in our project. Um, you know, the tickle has these commands that are also written in tickle, the DB mm -hmm. ones mm -hmm. that talk to the Oracle yeah. drivers. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't really know what's going on, but some kind of DML commands, for instance. So you just there still has to be that interface there that separates. No, then, uh, so what you have to think is with with a regular, so let us think of a, a tickle page. Okay, let's let's start from there. What is what is going on? It encounters HTML. It keeps on going. It hits the SQL uh, tickle command. It says, okay, I need to hand it over this to tickle interpreter. Now it finds this command, say set command, it substitutes its values, and we start we we instantiate some local variables which take on those values, and we continue interpreting it. So in that, it is just handing off control to the interpreter for that time being and bringing it back in. That is that kind of so that communication is a little different that is happening in terms of having an interpreter than when you have this is actually inside the database that is happening. I mean, to the database that is happening. So, so what happens when the tickle interpreter, interpreter hits the SQL query? What, how, how is that handled? Okay, so tickle interpreter does not hit a SQL well, query, right? When so it, that point in the tickle page actually comes. Right. So it say you you call whatever it is say ad underscore header, right? So now, and you give it, say, certain thing, okay? Or you do a DB transaction or whatever, whatever you do. So if something you... Something with the database. Yeah, yeah something with the database. Uh, you define a SQL and then you, say, even a select from the, mm -hmm. uh, from the database. Or do a DB DML and all those commands. So all those commands are actually defined in the library. Remember there was a, a directory under before www where you will define all your tickle procedures because at the time AOL server starts up it knows all it knows all these commands are available to be interpreted so still again there is so what it is doing is when you invoke those db transactions they actually go to talk to AOL server the um, oracle driver which is defined in our ini file that okay where is that driver located because driver has to do the translation of what is to be done to the of the SQL to the uh, database, right? You you pass the string till it till it is translated. It is a string, right? We call it. We actually say this, right? But then that driver has to do its job before it hits the database to actually tell it, no, this is really a SQL command. Is it clear? We can we can discuss later on also. We can actually pick up an example and go through the whole thing if you want. So this I, the idea of the embedded SQL is different than an o, the ODBC type, or are you saying embedded SQL is? You saying those are the same? Thing? Yeah. So ODBC is an example because here but because ODBC statements aren't, aren't there's no compiler for those. There's no DML. I mean this. This DML compiler, none of that happens. No, so what you are saying is, okay, let me, can we go, in, let's go in a sequence. I think otherwise we'll, we'll lose track of the communication. Uh, okay. Let me, so let me start from what is an API. Okay, then we'll go to specific examples of JDBC and ODBC. Okay.
So these are the standard APIs are standard protocols, or I should say uh, gateways that give you access to talk to applications. Okay, but these are well-defined standards, so you can actually use, say, give an example, you could use a JDBC driver to actually talk to something. Okay, translation being done. Okay, so what, what, uh, let me draw a diagram for you guys. So what will the application do? It will quest and then it has to then submit the SQL. It has to define this is the application now what you do is let us go to the next one which is driver manager okay let's stop here okay so now what is happening is that you wrote an application which makes calls to the sql okay this is a c application Okay, it is like if it is in C, for example, we could write something like this. Exec, SQL, and something like that. So the moment it hits here, it knows I am going to get a SQL file. SQL command, not say file. Okay, so these are, so these are well-defined, I should say, constructs that now C knows that I need to hand over the control of this part of it to the SQL or DML, whatever uh, compiler has to go into it. Okay, is that does that answer your question? Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm just I'm confused about the idea of compiling, and when you're talking about um, preprocessing. Preprocessor. Where do I? Where, uh, where is it? Uh, uh, demarcation of uh, SQL constructs for the preprocessor to recognize for the compiler for the host of languages invoked. I don't know. I mean, these things are all just function calls. No, no, no. So how will, how does now C know what to do with it? Calls a function. Exec is not a function for C. It has to, all it is asking for is that, okay, now I know following this is going to be a certain well-defined. So, okay, let me rephrase what you are saying, okay? Instead of, it is not really a function, you can call it as a macro. Let us think of it in that format. That now somewhere it is registered. It's the same thing. It is somewhere registered that when you hit this, this is what you have to do. Does that make sense? It does, but then that's different than what ODBC or what those other things are. I mean, ODBC are function calls. They're, I mean, it's what we did. I mean, it's what people who use .NET, for instance, did. No, that is to connect. So ODBC gives you only the connectivity to the database. Okay, it is, you can think of it as the driver part of it. Right. Well, we Which will have a, yeah, but, okay, let us, uh, let me uh, finish this, because you raised that point, that, again, you have to think of that this connectivity has to come from a specific host language. That is why you have two different JDBC and ODBC. We'll, we'll go over it again if you want later when on. When you do this, you get a separate SQL file that's compiled, right, that you have to link with the other file. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's basically, yeah, yeah, no, it does. I mean, because you have to break it. Yeah, you have to, you have to break it. You have to break it because you have to interpret these DML commands. Right? You have to, you actually, I'll actually, what I'll do is, let's wait till the, till another page, and I'll actually, the diagram that I made for you guys, I'll draw it again on the, on the board and we'll discuss this more. Okay? So, so, so it seems most likely you could do less stuff, right? Database. How would you talk to directly to the database? Your interface is going to be just a SQL prompt. What you, you embed in SQL, you can you write commands for any kind of database, right? Right. No, so you have to have a... So that is why I wanted to come here. With embedded SQL, this driver manager has to have that driver registered to interpret it also, right? Because what you are going to do is you are going to, in your application, suppose you wrote your SQL command, right? Some driver has to then go in and interpret that. So this driver manager is going to look for an appropriate driver that can execute your work. Yeah, but suppose you do, if you want to do something very specific to what Oracle, it's only Oracle you do, but SQL Server cannot do. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that then? Okay, There's, you're confusing two issues. One is, this is specificity of host language, not of database. So now this host language is deciding what kind of driver it needs to talk to. Right? A C language, if C or C++ is the language. So what you are saying is that Oracle specific is totally different thing than this right now. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm trying to... But it has to, to be translated, right? From your embedded SQL, you translate mm -hmm. to some Oracle command. Mm -hmm. But that embedded SQL could also be translated to SQL, SQL Server command. Yeah, so it will have its own driver, exactly. So, say... Uh, no, I, I, I don't know. It could oh. be, I'm just saying, so it seems like some stuff you can you won't be able to really do with embedded SQL, perhaps, or... Some in what sense? Maybe because Oracle is different than SQL Server. Internet. Right, so you'll have a driver registered for it, for Oracle, uh, driver registered for it in the driver manager. Because this is, driver manager will select what driver to use. Is everybody confused? I'm getting that feeling. <coughs> I think using the term embedded SQL is. I, I think we're thinking it's something different than what we did. Than what, you know, that somehow it's a different thing than what we put in our web pages. And. I okay, mean, you are, you are, I think what you are confusing here probably is that what we did in our web pages, we used an interpreted language. Right? Well, not all of us. But. Okay, so. But then I'm mistaken, so sorry. Really no, it, anyway, it, the SQL isn't compiled no matter, the SQL isn't compiled in, in my compiled C-sharp pages either. So the SQL is just left as a text string that's submitted to the database. So who, what submits to the database? Where, so this is, so what is happening is you have probably, so you wrote this page, right? Yeah. It's an HTML page or with some different extension probably so that request processor knows uh, this is the type of page I'm getting. Sure, it's I mean it's in C sharp, but it's just yeah, it's like tickle, it's the same thing. Right, so it is a different extension, right? So that different extension makes a difference, because if you if you have an HTML page with a tickle command in it, running on your server, it won't do anything. Right, but embedded. Um, I'm not trying to say this right. The embedded SQL. Is just it's a SQL string that's an Oracle formatted SQL string, or it's a SQL Server SQL formatted string. It's not some different thing. Embedded SQL is just saying we're taking SQL statements that are written <laughs> in a SQL language for a specific database and embedding them in app, in other applications, so other applications can access data from that database. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so, so now I'm confused because then you <laughs> <laughs> because then you need to change your, all your queries in your program. Right? So yes, you, you do to change the database. Server. So, so where's the flexibility? And, and that's true. I mean, if you're using yeah. non-standard SQL. Yeah. Yeah. No, if you have to. <laughs> the, okay. <laughs> let's let's rephrase the question. What is the question? 
what is uh, question is what is what is embedded SQL? Okay, is the question? I think I have some idea what people are confused about. Maybe is there is there a difference between what Tickle does when it sends a a, a SQL query off? and what JDBC does? Yes. Okay, and what is that difference? Okay, so that difference is where if you, what you have is you have a program or in a host language that needs to be compiled. Okay, now if this program needs to be compiled, then you need to actually, but this compiler does not know about all these DML statements. It can't compile them. Which, which one are we talking about now? We're talking the about first one. Or we're talking about Tickle? No, no, I'm talking about the compiled language, so it is C. I'm talking about C. Okay, let me start again. So we're talking about a compiled language. It could be C or Java, whatever language you take. Okay? Now what you do is you have SQL commands that are interspersed inside your code. Because maybe you want to, what you want to do is you want to show a form which you want to populate from your database. But, but those SQL commands, are they specific to either SQL Server or Oracle, or are they like more generic? They'll be, they have to be specific. If they are generic, that's fine also. But then the pre-compiler, right? So, OK, let me, let me just draw it again, OK? I think it will become clear now. This, this was an appropriate question. So love, not to say anything else, but <laughs> this, is, this is something I could get my head around. <laughs> Okay, so let me let me do this. Okay, so what we did was we wrote an application, okay, which has SQL commands embedded in it. There is some host language. For an example, let us take C. Okay, you have C code, and then you have say SQL code, and then the C code continues. Okay. So now if we give this to C compiler, it is going to complain because it does not know what to do with this. So what we do is we hand it over to pre-compiler. Okay? Now this pre-compiler is going to break it into C code and DML statements. Okay? Now those Again, remember that these things have to be combined again later on. Okay? Now what is going to happen is the DML compiler the DML compiler is going to compile this part and the C compiler is going to compile this part. Okay? And then these object codes are going to be linked and then serve to the runtime environment. As a, yeah, as, as one entity. Okay, okay, I think, okay. So my still, question is still, this SQL statement you have in your code, yeah. is that there, is that specific to the database on multiple? Okay, systems? so let's go to that question now. Okay, so now you wrote this application, now to do this, to work with this, you have to actually find the right driver that can do the translation also. Right? You wrote this say in SQL, in say MS SQL, right? Microsoft uh, SQL code. Okay. So there has to be a driver that can interpret this. If you don't have that driver available to your driver manager, then there is a problem. But if you have all the other drivers, registered, then it is not a problem. Okay, so suppose now I, I, I want to change the database to Oracle. Where do mm -hmm. I need to change that? Yeah, you'll have to change the code. I have to change the code. Yeah, or if you can, or, or if there is a driver which is generic enough to take, and if you write a generic SQL, don't write a SQL which is specific to Postgres or Oracle or your uh, implementation. If you write a generic SQL, but then I don't know if that, that driver is available. If that was the case, I think ACS would be running on every, everybody would write in that SQL. So you have to have an engine to interpret it. That is the thing. What so is so in the driver? I'm sorry? What is in the driver? Okay, so in the driver... Does the driver contain the DML compiler for Oracle? I'm sorry? Does the Oracle driver contain the DML compiler for Oracle? So the driver, okay. no, driver is interpreter. Okay. 
okay it lets you talk to different things and that driver depending on in what place it is sitting in this communication channel it could be talking to two different two different instances also all it is doing is letting you talk to so let us uh, for an example so where does the dml compiler come from okay so dml compiler is a part of database dbms okay. so the pre compiler then knows to send the c code whatever to the c compiler and then the dml down to yeah. the database So why is this like very powerful? Okay, so what you are doing is you did this, you wrote this code. You want to say introduce. You have a, a code in which you want to you want to have a GUI interface from C or Java, and then you want to talk to a database, right? How do you do it? Either you write two different things and then combine them in the presentation. Right, or you do it this way. Is there so a it is. A system that works this way. Is this, sorry? is this a theoretical thing, or is there really a system that works this way? I I think the answer to that is it enables this thing. You can do it this way. You can use it. I don't know of any C compiler that I could dump a SQL statement in the middle. You're not compiling it to C. You have to. You are giving it to a pre-compiler. <coughs> that is a part of DBMS. It has a special exec. Yeah, it has to. I mean, it has to. What you are thinking right now is compiling it as a part of C code. It is not a GCC or some. Okay. Right. So there is some tool with Oracle that I can feed a C program that has SQL statements. Sort of you can enable exactly. So you can enable this. I think that is probably that is what was the stem of com confusion probably. So what it is doing is let me just just converge on this that it is enabling you to use this. Okay, embedded SQL gives you another way to extend the SQL functionality. Rather than keeping SQL in a totally isolated environment, now you have the flexibility to actually so I really don't want to distract you guys again back to uh, the tickle level server, but rem remember how powerful it became that if you could embed tickle inside HTML. Right? Oh, that's all I wanted to, as an example, I want to pull back in. That's all. But that is the, the idea in the sense. But because these are compiled host languages, that is why we actually need to split the two things, make sure that appropriate compilers get the right code and after the object code is created is when you can do the linking. So I guess the .NET, which you write in C sharp or C++, does this, right? I have not used .NET, I'm sorry. Is it, is it, is it, we, can, we can look into it. It compiles to C sharp. Because it's just those function calls and those function calls, you know, the, you write a SQL statement and that SQL statement is just stored as text in the program. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets to the point in execution, it sends that text string to uh, the database and says... What oh, sense? What sense? There has to be a driver to do that because a driver has to parse... I'm just wondering. I'm sorry. ODBC is in between it. Oh, okay. So the, what I'm saying is that there has to be something that will let you... And that is what... Was, so somewhere it broke C-sharp from the SQL, right? No. It's just, a, it's just another function call. There's just there's an object. I so you can think of then this. You will call this then a function. Is that what it is? You are preceding. You are preceding your SQL with, with something that this OS recognizes and takes it out. Doesn't compile it with C sharp. No, it does compile. It's just. I mean, it's just not. Okay, I, okay. It's, it's, it's not worth spending the time on. Yeah. yeah. No, I'll, I think I can answer what you're saying. So what, what they have done is you can think of it as well-defined macros. And because to begin with, it knows it is it has to have a syntax in front of it. It can compile it. It won't do anything with it till it hits the database. All it is doing is it is doing a syntax checking. It is going to make sure, yes, the arguments for this procedure or function are appropriate. And leave it there. Okay, and then what it will say, okay, I know 
all I have to, or maybe it'll tag it at the time of compilation. I need to send this over through the ODBC and grab this thing. Yeah. So in a way, what they are enabling is the same thing, except except of actually me calling it that it is splitting them. It might be just putting them in special quotes and saying, don't compile it, just do a parsing of error of argument comparison. Okay, it should get a string, it should have an integer as an argument, and just leave it there, as long as syntax is correct. And then we'll shove it over to OD. I don't know, I'm just, yeah, so I learned something about .NET today. <laughs> now I can talk about it. <laughs> no, I will not talk about it. Okay, so is that, is that okay? Next is I wanted to go into triggers or cursors. Shall we do it right now or should we leave it for our recitation? I'll just, why don't I tell you why, uh, why do we, why cursors are powerful? Cursors are powerful because if you think of, of, uh, if you think of a set of return values being returned in say seven different rows, okay, usually the language is like C, and uh, Java or all these standard languages, they are very well suited to handle variables, not groups of variables. Okay, so what, what cursors allow you to do is that you could, if you open a cursor and you get, say, seven different rows returned from your select statement, using a cursor, you can loop through this. Trigger and cursor are the same? No, wait. Uh, let's just, uh, this is triggers on, uh, sorry, cursors. <laughs> so you can actually, what it is enabling you is to loop through each row and then work with it. Okay, so what it is, so now if you are doing just a loop in, say, a compiled language to be able to actually work with it, you could start working with row by row rather than seven by, say, this was. So rather than working with a matrix of 7 by 10, it is actually looking at three variables only, step by step. So, I mean, and I'll have Rusty cover it more, a little bit more in recitation, but that is the power of of cursors, where it lets you handle the this, things with this. This isn't part of the SQL statement. No, 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 it is. No, no cursor is uh, another, uh, um, can I call it a data type? I don't know what is the appropriate term for it. Cursors. SQL. So in SQL, you can actually, it is like a, a procedure. Yeah, so what you are doing is you are returning a group of, you are getting a matrix instead of a single row. So you have to find a way to actually traverse through it. So that is what cursors let you do. Instead of getting a, actually, appropriate term is data set because instead of getting a, an individual value, you're actually getting a group of, of values. Okay. With triggers, I, I mean, you must have used it, but the biggest word of caution is, so triggers are anything that you, uh, it's like a procedure that you define, but it has an event associated with it. Okay, so you can say that when you can do something like a, uh, I should actually clean this up. Okay, so what you're doing here is you created a trigger called my trigger before there is an insert on this table. Okay, so what you did was this is where you defined an event that is associated with this trigger and then you can, so here you can do a begin and so whenever, so all this code 
that is following this will happen the moment this is the case. Is it create trigger or yeah. execute trigger? No, create. You are creating a trigger. It is a SQL syntax because SQL has to identify it. So what you are doing is you are creating a trigger before insert on this. Now you say, okay, every time a new student registers, I want to make sure that registration has not gone over 10. Okay, let us assume that. That is the case. So what you could do is you could actually do a here, here do a select on your table, count the number of students, put it into a variable, okay? And if that, and compare it with 10. If it is more than 10, you could say, begin and send me email or something like that. Send email, whatever action you want to do. So that I can close the registration. So what you did was you created a condition for it to execute. There is an event. Every time that event occurs, it is going to go and check if the number of students is less than 10. If it is, it won't do anything. But if it is 10, it is going to go and send me an email that yes, now the action has occurred. Okay, so there are there are a lot of ways you can use triggers as you want to make sure you can maintain data integrity with this. Okay, you can uh, control a lot of things. But problem occurs when people actually start defining nested triggers. Because it is very, very difficult to actually trace nested triggers. You could be actually, if, if suppose this happens, you can actually call another trigger here. And it is, it is very difficult to trace them and become memory hogs. So be careful, but our triggers are very, very powerful. Okay, it is like whenever somebody registers, you could send them a welcome message. So what you could say is whenever there is an insert on users, you could actually send an email every time anybody is registered or something like that. Okay, and you can do before or an after. That's okay. stored in the database. Yeah. Permanent yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. These can't be tied to rollbacks. You can't send a. You can't, a string. You can't tie no, but no, wait. So register. rollbacks are a part of transaction. Mm -hmm. Right? So you can get the database back into the state it was at the last save point, but any email that you sent out, you have no confirmatory or. There's not a way to send another email saying, please disregard previous. The rollback just goes back to a snapshot, so it doesn't know about the time sequence of, of uh, <coughs> Let me think. So what you are saying is, Oh, oh, okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, not, not in terms of. Because there is no trigger does not have a timestamp associated with it. But if you did an after, then wouldn't it fire after the transaction had completed? So you wouldn't. No, you can. I mean, it depends on what you. If if your your event there is actually a transaction, you could do that. Depending on what event you define. And this this could actually be an insert on sold goods, you know. That actually will happen when you have a transaction completed. That is when there will be an insert in sold goods, and you could do the same thing. I think you have to treat them like side effects, basically. Yeah. But, you know, it's, a, it's a bang thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what they call the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Once it goes, <laughs> can't ask for the bullet back. <laughs> okay? Is the pace okay? You guys give me some feedback. I mean, so, no, I think it is good. I think, I mean, it is, it is better to do it while we are having a discussion because I end up learning too.